Rick. Okay, um, yeah, today I would like to talk about GoCD or a bit about GoCD and some words about continuous integration and continuous whatnot, what all the buzzwords are. Uh, I'm not, I have a disclaimer because I'm not an expert in continuous XYZ, I just occasionally use this phrases. But I tried to figure it out and hopefully I got it right, but if I don't, then feel free to interrupt me. Um, I don't want to, to convey false information, so I hope that I got it right. And I asked one colleague of mine and he said, it's close to be right, so better be. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a couple of slides about continuous XYZ. And then um, after I can either, I would demo my GoCD setup and uh, I can also give a quick recap of this talk that I gave in Lugano last week, the week before, or three weeks even. So the last talk I gave in Lugano about Docker. Um, yeah, it was this is the state of Docker containers in HPC, and I think I had some nice slides about what the problems currently are and what enterprise IT and HPC in general. Um, are facing and I think that everyone faces the same problem so that's maybe worthwhile to talk about it uh, what else I yeah I tinkered around with Docker last weekend again but maybe I can talk about it after the second talk oh yeah okay we can just chat so let's jump right in um, I said a couple of slides and I have this nice setup I'm just, I'm just proud of it so anyway talk about it as well. So the agenda looks as follows. So first I will introduce continuous what, so X, Y, Z, um, all the passwords maybe we, we need to know. Uh, some alternatives to GoCD and at the end GoCD. So that's pretty short agenda. First, um, let's look at the continuous password universe. The rough history, at least to me, seems uh, we have this automated testing thing, then we have uh, continuous testing, continuous delivery, and then continuous deployment. So this is basically the agenda. And yeah, so first, auto automated testing. I think it's quite a couple of years now old. I, th and I worked at the one company I worked with, this kind of automated testing as well, where you have also like this PEP8 test, which gives you uh, failures if you violate some naming schemes or if you violate intentions or so really quality testing of the code without looking at what would be the impact of the code of, of the failure that you generate right and so if you have a naming scheme a violation then the customer even wouldn't care because it's internal stuff but automated testing was a local test to to try to figure out if the code is, is good and the quality is good. So it's not only risky um, tests that are done. And it, as said, fails even if trial errors occurs, at least to Wikipedia. <coughs> the next was uh, continuous testing. It was basically automated testing or some automated testing at every commit. So you commit it to, um, to your repository, set a repository, then this triggers a, a, a test run or a build first, and then it is deployed in a staging environment or um, and, and then it's tested. And this test uh, only checks for user impact or business risk impact. So it's not if there is a PEP8 failure or warning, then this might even go through. I mean, and this, I think, also has, I mean, everything is in a context, and this might change in different contexts. I think some companies might even do this continuous testing with a more a uh, harder approach where you also fail when some violations of naming schemes or whatnot, some, uh, some um, cosmetic failures are occurring. So I think this, that, that's highly um, dynamic depending on your environment. But at least according to the book, and the book is here Wikipedia, it only fails when there's a big impact, a risky uh, business risk involved. And the next on the list is continuous delivery, which just means that each commit is not only tested and gives feedback, but also uh, is turned into a deployable re. So their artifacts are created and release packages are created, and you can, you could, if you would, uh, or if you want to, you can uh, install the release that is created by continuous delivery. So uh, yeah, whereas the previous uh, part, there is only tests 
and no release packaging or, or artifact bundling is going on. Yeah, so this is uh, another slide or some picture to, to uh, get, the, get the gist. So first, someone checks in his code, then the first um, simple tests built and unit tests are, uh, the unit tests fail, so he gets feedback and then he can change his code, commit, uh, check in again, triggers again this build. Then there is some automated acceptance tests going on, so more complex tests, fails again, and so on. There's feedback again in the middle of the slide, and then he checks in the final one where the acceptance test is, um, or the automated acceptance test uh, ran through, and uh, the, the, this triggers feedback that it's finished, and then it waits for approval, so the user acceptance test it has to be manual, right? So you have to look at the code or look at the at the application and verify that it's that it's uh, according to the books. Then it gets feedback again, and then it's released, and then it's um, going to be deployable. So that's continuous delivery. And as I said, continuous deployment is just another automation step where after the release is cut, um, the deployment is also automatic. So for instance, the Docker image is built, and once it's built, all the agents um, detect that there's a new image, then they download the image and restart the service and off you go, or there's a rolling update or what have you. Um, one more slide that I found, found yesterday and I found it very interesting, but I was told that it's considered by some fairly old, is a V model, but I think it's nice. Um, so from top, from bottom to top, we, we have more and more complex tests. So unit tests is just individual components tests, integration tests, it's component groups tests and system and so on. It's going to get more and more complex. And the, the higher, highest level is an acceptance test, which is an end-to-end -end test for the final system stack, basically. So far, so good, or so far, so bad? What do you think? Do you like the B model? I like the B model. <laughs> no? Okay. So that's it. And uh, sure, I mean, there's another, there's a, a pyramid model or a pyramid picture. I, I didn't put it in, but it's obvious that the unit test is used much more often and much more frequent than the more complete, uh, more complex tests because as they are more complex, they take longer and it's more resource intensive to use them. So you want to use the simple tests more often and then go up the chain. I mean, but it's, I think, obvious. And you have less of them. Yeah, you have less of them because they span more stuff, right? If you have an end-to-end -end test, then all these pieces in the end-to-end -end test are before then tested in simpler tests and so on. So it's a basic tree, right? Yeah, so some tools, um, and this is uh, really an incomplete list. There is a complete list on Wikipedia, and I, I think I, I knew maybe 10 of the, I have heard 10 of the, of the names in the list. But I think where we all can agree that everyone knows about Jenkins, and a little bit um, uh, controversial, I won't say, but a little bit punchy is it, uh, it's like Nagios and monitoring. So everyone has used Nag uh, Jenkins, I think, right? Or who haven't used Jenkins? No one, and no. I think most of us might even have misused Nagios and uh, misused Jenkins. Like I, I, uh, I, for instance, used it as a cron tab UI, basically, where you have like scheduled tests or scheduled tasks, uh, where you could just see if it was failing or the history of the task. But it's, it's really you can misuse it in a lot of ways, oh, but I, I don't know if it's misused, but you can use it in a, in a lot of different ways. And this, I think, one of the big things with Jenkins, so if you talk to 10 people about Jenkins, it's hard to get one use case across, I think, because everyone has different backgrounds with Jenkins, and so it's really kind of yeah, hard. Like, I mean, Nargis has a, has a purpose, and it has only one purpose. Uh, but for Jenkins, it's like everyone uses this in his way. So it's very powerful. There are a lot of plugins. You can do a lot of good things with it. Um, but I think since it's so powerful and has so much plugins and so weird plugins for, for some cases, as said. Um, yeah, I think it's a little bit old for this purpose. But anyway, that's just me. <coughs> What I would like to look at, but I hooked with Google CD, so I haven't looked at it, is GitLab CD, CI. 
Uh, it seems very cool because it, if you look, if you use GitLab, I think then it's really cool because it hooks into GitLab and GitLab it's an open source uh, on-premise Git, GitHub implementation, right? Um, seems to be very nice because you can do a lot of nice uh, stuff with it. You you have the the pull request as well in uh, GitLab and and the different build branches and so on, and it hooks into this quite nicely as it seems. So. If you use GitLab, then you might want to use this. But today we want to talk about GoCD, or I wanted to show off GoCD, and that's my current favorite. It's from ThoughtWorks, and it's Java, that's a drawback, uh, but anyway, even though it's called GoCD. And um, yeah, it has a nice notion of pipelines I will show in a bit, and um, also has cool build templates. So for instance, if you build Docker images, as I will show in a bit, uh, I have only one template for my all my building pipelines because I only build uh, Docker images with it. So I just configure how stuff is done once, and then I just add new pipelines, and it's uh, quite nice. And I have also some tests in it. Oh yeah. And that are the slides. So now I have a quick demo. So questions so far? Is there other? CI tools that I should have mentioned, but I haven't. Some favorites, some broken hearts. <laughs> <laughs> I think what is uh, currently yeah, kind of feeling at uh, things like Travis or Circle or Lambda CD, where your build script is already part of the code, which is not in Jenkins. Okay, you can do it in Jenkins with a special plugin and could be also not. I think these are maybe interesting if you have a look at. Uh, Current blah 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 tool. But is it? I mean, I think I would like to have it on premise rather than have it somewhere else. I mean, Travis CI, if you if you cannot run it on tra premise, right? It's just it's it, it's a free service as far as I understood. Well, you, can you, can you can run it. Yeah. Okay. Then I have. Okay. Or well, take uh, Lambda CD as another example where you are all your pipelines are just closed tools. Okay. Um, this is just a new direction where uh, the pipeline is building code on and not with a visual tool. Yeah. And so you have all the things you are used to, like um, versioning of your build pipeline, which is really nice. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a kind of uh, I agree that here. So it's kind of a pity here. If I like templates, so I just jump in. I, I don't have a special agenda, but so. Uh, here I have my only uh, pipeline template for builds. It's called Docker Build, and it looks like this. The rest are provided by GoCD out of the box. No, no, this but I. But usually you have. No, no, <laughs> this is all my Docker images. I was really, I was astonished how <laughs> many Docker images I have. But yeah, it's like 80 now, I think. But yeah, so maybe. So what what do we have here? So I have this template. And this template comprises of stages, and the stage I only have one stage here. It's uh, it's called Docker Build. It's right. It's clever naming. <laughs> looking at it, and it has one job. Also clever naming, Docker Build. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I have a couple of uh, tasks. And to give you a perspective of how it could look like, so. And I, I, I haven't figured it out or I haven't used it for, to the full extent, I think that's fair to say, because as you see here, you can have multiple different passes where source code is going. You could fan out, which means that you have uh, parallel builds and then fan in to, to, for instance, create a package that comprises of multiple source codes, right? So that you need to wait for all the different um, stages before. And then you have integration tests and so on. You can easily you could fan out again. So this is what you see here in the test end integration step. So you can model the complete pipeline from uh, from building to test and release in GoCD. And as you can have this little GoCD agents everywhere we like. You can even from start misusing it. I think uh, for deployment as well because you could trigger uh, Docker pull with this um, agent as well mm -hmm. at the end. That's what I think I would like to do. Not sure if it's if I will be hated for that, but because it's, I think, starting to misuse it the same way as I misused Jenkins. But 
just me. Mm. I won't call this misuse yeah. because I think <coughs> in the end it's the end of the pipeline is a deployment. So uh, why is, should it be a misuse if you think it continues? Yeah, but you could also. Deployment? I mean, there's there are a lot of uh, plugins, so I can maybe mm -hmm. I can open the plugins section here somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think here's a link. Down here is a link. Yeah. So the, the documentation is really nice. There are other tools like as there's Quick Build and Buildbot and so on. There are other, or I mean, a tremendous amount of, of tools, and some are very good documented, and some are rather poor implemented or documented. And this one is pretty nicely documented, I think. For instance, we have this API thing here as well. So everything is API-ish. You can call everything with JSON blobs and so on and so on. And, and you have authentication, authorization against LDAP and all that. So it seems to be pretty nice. But uh, let's look at the plugins here. So there are, and this is, I think, also unique. Or I don't know if it's unique. But for instance, this package repository plugins. I was wondering first, for the first day, what this is all about. But it's pretty simple. So you can uh, create a YAM repository polar and then let him pull on the Apple repository of, uh, of YAM, of CentOS or Red Hat for that matter. And uh, if there is a change, then he triggers a build, which is pretty nice. So if, uh, and I think I haven't used it, but I think that you can even uh, tell him only for certain packages or you can blacklist packages that if uh, an RPM is updated that you don't care about, then there will be um, there will be no, no no trigger, but this is kind of nice, and uh, this goes for Debian, for YAM, for Docker registry, and so on. So external dependencies, basically, which could trigger um, uh, a build. And for me, this is, I think, for me, it's pretty nice because Docker registries, for instance, uh, if the Debian base image or the Alpine image, the latest one, is updated, what I have to do now is. I have to trigger it manually, right? Because there is no trigger. I can use Docker Hub. There will be a trigger, but for me, there's no trigger. So this is kind. Of, this is very nice. Um, so this is a trigger. Then there are tasks. So yeah, um, as I as I showed here, we have this beautiful named template, stage, and job, and then the tasks. And here you can just add new tasks. So I have only couple of uh, plugins installed and I, I do not even use the docker task because uh, I like it with shared scripts better for whatever reason I think I should use it but anyway so you could create tasks with this as well I use the script executor task but you have a couple of yeah, you have more and more tasks here you have even a select task so you can send select messages be nice then uh, notification plugins, I mean, that the name says it, right? So you can e send emails and select messages if the build uh, is configured or is ready or failed and so on. So And you could also use GitHub pull requests to trigger builds and then um, just build a certain pull request and then update GitHub according to, <coughs> to the, the GitHub messages and the pull request according to the outcome of the build, which is also nice. Reman notification. I want to use something like Reman, but haven't used it yet. Yeah, and then uh, pull requests, triggers, and or and different authentication plugins. I just use the built-in um, authentication. Um, yeah, this I haven't used old artifacts, but this seems to be valid. And then are uh, enterprise plugins that I didn't use, and I think I won't progress. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there will be more here in the press section anyway. But yeah, this is not, I'm, I don't use it. What I miss a little bit is that I cannot specify, as far as I understood it, I cannot specify Docker images as artifacts. So the artifacts has to be some thing, some file, some directory, which is kind of OK. But for me, if I create a Docker uh, image, then I I push it to the um, to the to my internal repository, and I can show you the stack. Yeah, show the stack in a bit. Um, I push it to the internal repository, and then uh, it triggers a new build from the next next stage, so, so to speak. And um, I always have to <coughs> to down or to to pull and push the different images to the to the central from my central registry. Would be nicer if I could have uh, a nice um, artifact. 
where I say, okay, I put, I created this artifact with this registry URL, so out of my head, this would look like this, and then I would have the name and the tag, and this is an artifact that the other, the next, um, the next um, stage could use. But, but maybe I should click here, write a plugin, but it's Java, so maybe I won't click here. But if there's an API, so maybe I do something else. Okay, so let's have a look at the, not here. Let's have a look at the, at the stack real quick. Should I make it a little bit bigger? I guess so, right? So it runs my old university. Uh, and it's So it's my orchestra um, repository, so it's on GitHub, and it uses, looks kind of like this. I have a console, as I always have console. I started OpenLDAP, but I don't use it yet. Uh, and I have a registry which provides a registry to the agent and the server. And both agents using, because I don't have much space here, only 60 gigabytes or so, the agents are configured to use the um, Docker socket of the host, which is also kind of nice. For for Ubuntu Docker, for instance, is also nice because if you do this like this, then if an agent builds an image, it's also present on your or it, it will be built on your Docker, Ubuntu Docker instance, and then you have it ready to to use in your Docker environment, which is uh, I think a nice thing to do uh, for bigger build so I have something somewhere else. Um, I don't use the, the socket of the host. I just, if I don't provide this, then um, he will create, and, and I don't provide this uh, environment variable. The agent will spawn its own Docker daemon within his himself, so it's uh, inception basically, mm -hmm. and then it will just push and pull the images to the central repository. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also nice because if you have bigger, fatter machines with more cores, like a machine with 32 cores, then it could run, at, I think, at least four or five or six or whatnot uh, agents on this box because you have a lot of headroom and um, they won't build um, very parallel uh, in, in at the same time. So I think that's kind of nice. And the cool thing is that you have a go-to, uh, an agent auto-enable key and maybe no, now I have it shown, I should, <laughs> should change it before I put it online. Um, yeah, but, but I, I could just spawn a new agent here. So, Demogod, be with me. I will just create a new one for the heck of it. And maybe before I do, I would show you how they currently look like. So I just give it a new name. The rest should stay the same. And uh, we go to the agents section here. Agents. So we have two agents. Agent 1, agent 2. And you can even see how much free space is left. And yeah, resources, I don't use this much. But yeah, you could imagine that you have a, um, an agent maybe with an SSD or with more space than usual. And then you have different pipelines, maybe one pipeline needs a lot of space, so you could put it on this resource constraint and say, okay, this should be built on a, on a resource with this, um, or on, a, on an agent with this resource. But I don't use this feature yet. Okay, so we see I have only one agent. If I do <coughs> compose up minus D three, Then he creates a new agent. And I can make this bigger as well. <coughs> oh, and I created, um, I pushed some code, but I didn't, um, yeah, so magic, right? He's registered his, himself, which is kind of nice. And, uh, but the, yeah, not much magic. So, and, um, yeah, so I have a couple of pipelines, and I think it's nicer to see here. 
So I have an Alpine pipeline, as I use Alpine now for a living, kind of. Um, there are a couple of images I created in Alpine. For instance, this GoCD server itself. And maybe we can have a look here. So I have this pipeline here, so I have this template here. So you see it's just a template. Um, it's paused because I wait for the meetup. The material is first, yeah, it's, it's uh, the um, GitHub repository, which will trigger, if there is a change, which will trigger um, the, the build. And I can specify different uh, directories if I want to, to fetch out or to fetch multiple different uh, Git repositories, then I should, or I have to even, have to specify a destination directory, which makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you could have multiple of those. And then you can say pull for new changes, which uh, for me it's um, it's a given. And yeah, you can blacklist uh, files from the from the pool as well. And then I have a parent trigger. So if this uh, this pipeline changes, then this is triggered. But I and I halted it. So let's see if it works. And I have a couple of uh, broken ones. Because Alpine is Moodle, lib and it's not libc, oh, and if I try to compile something, then it mostly fails. So ah, here we go. So here it's building. One nice feature, I think, or what the nicest feature to show other people is, <laughs> is this um, overview. So you can clearly see which, um, how is it called, pipeline number? No. So which iteration, so to speak. Uh, was or triggered which build so I can see that this five was triggered by or was built on top of the second iteration of this image and so on and so you can see all the images here mm -hmm. um, and if I click here then I see all the images that are uh, children or yeah, all the children's as well and if I click here then I see the current build <coughs> process um, what I really like is this here, so you could, if you have multiple uh, materials, so multiple sources with multiple GitHub repositories, then you can even see when there is, oh, I can go for, for one, maybe, I don't know if there's much change here, but you can see multiple uh, changes in the Git repository of different, um, of different parents. For instance, here I, I have a, ah, oh, there's no change, but Imagine there's a change. Ah, here, no, here's a change. So I added here in the console image, I added nmap and bc. And uh, in this GoCD server image, I added this two commits. So if you want to compare different, different, um, different iterations of a given pipeline, and you have multiple parents, or a tree of parents, then this is pretty, pretty nice, because you can see what has changed between version 1 and version 5. This is, I think, very, very cool. But not only this, uh, yeah, you could I mean that's that's uh, classic. You can see the console uh, the console output here, and yeah, uh, also always already done. Um, you can see if you go here, then you can. Oh no, wait, where have to go here? Yeah, then you have a graph on failures and um, on on. Uh, passes, so how long does it take? You can add easily, which I haven't done yet, but it's, it's, it's easily, you could add your own tabs here. Yeah. So you, you can just uh, create an artifact which creates a website or a video or whatnot, and then you can uh, provide the, the build with, uh, say, okay, I want another tab, then you name the tab, then you point to the artifact and the website or what, and then it will be displayed here, which I would like to try out someday but haven't yet because I don't, don't have the time or the need. Uh, and what I what I also do, I, I played a little bit around and got frustrated about SSL when I used here this Alpine Nginx and Window, I called it Window. Window is basically, um, it's, uh, it's an Nginx proxy that looks for tags in console. Uh, maybe I could, should I show it? i show it. I right, just show it here. Let's see. A little bit bigger. So, Docker. Docker window. 
and this is uh, so I, I in, in my pipeline I look for the pre-built uh, script if there is a pre-built script then this will be triggered <coughs> before the docker the docker build is done so I create certificates first so I do some very very ugly bash script here I should use let's, en let's encrypt by the way but also I didn't and um, then it looks for a test and the test which shows what what's um, what's done here. So the test comprises of a couple of of, uh, of of containers. So one console container, as I always have a console container, then a window container and two nginx, um, both exporting AT and yeah, two two websites basically. And um, what the the window container does, he looks for changes in the in no. He looks for changes. Normally, he looks for changes. He looks for changes in the um, in in the console services. So in console, you can specify services, right? And the nginx uh, containers they will con uh, they will um, register services. And if this service has a tag HTTP or HTTPS, then the window will. Uh, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll create an Nginx configuration that forwards to this specific service. Because I, I have the problem, or the problem, it's a first world problem, but uh, I have a, a couple of uh, containers with websites, and I always have to remember, okay, I have to go to this IP address and then this port to go to this website. And so I would like to have one single point of entry where I just have window, the window IP, and then slash, and then the container name that I would like to see, and then I should have the the website. That's the, the idea behind it. And the test just um, sets up the uh, yeah, starts the stack, waits a couple of seconds, and then curls for different um, for different entries or for different um, yeah for different entries. In the in the HTTP and HTTPS connection, and yeah, that should be should be it. Why even would your Docker <coughs> compose for the Go agent? Do you need it console over there? Pun? You have a doc where you have your Go CD agent and stuff like that. You mm -hmm. also added console over there. Yeah. Because of? Because um, for instance, the the Go CD server. So yeah, I can I can jump into one here. Mm. Docker exec minus dh go cd or go cd agent zero one zero one is it the correct no it's like this dash um, so I have a couple of services here and the stupid service go cd agent has a configuration uh, somewhere config. And I just agent JKS. Ah, oh, damn it! Where is the configuration? But I, I just point to um, go cd server dot service. I think service console, and then I should service. Maybe not. Go cd server. Mm. Uh, it's not a service. I have to ping the node. But I just specify this console like uh, DNS name, and then I don't care what IP okay, address. And the same goes for the agents and the registry as well. So I can just use um, Docker registry okay. dot registry. This is a service, pretty sure. Or not? <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, registry. This is a service. So I can use this um, generic IP, uh, DNS names instead of IP addresses, mm -hmm. which is pretty uh, nice. And and uh, for this Windows stuff, I would use the same. I would um, provide the IP address or but provide the window the IP address. All CD agents are built from the base Docker image, which much more use console to register themselves. Who, who is doing the registration in, in that case? Um, are you, yeah, I have the, the console, um, I can show you the, the build here. Um, so I, the console agent here, 
is parent of everything. So I have console installed, then I have syslog installed, and then I have GRE installed, and then both of them are on top of console. And console provides a directory etc console where you can specify um, different checks. And here I have the check Docker engine, for instance, if it's running or not. But it's not. And for this, it's even it's nicer to look at the server, I think. So we have the console daemon here, and he has a, he should have. That's why the service is not there. We have the registry. Registry three. Here we go. Console. Here I have the Docker registry JSON file, and this just provides a script or a mm -hmm. command to check for the service. And if I do console reload, then um, I could create a new service. So for instance, I could create the service test. Now, yeah, test. Yeah, then it's found. But this I showed, I think, a couple of steps ago. But <coughs> test port 6000. As a script, I do exit 0. So the exit code is like Nagios. Mm -hmm. If I do console reload, then I have yeah, a new service, huh? test service. Here we go. And if I do, if I do exit two, then I shouldn't. I think I shouldn't have test service anymore. <coughs> Here we go. <laughs> Which I really like, and I, I really like it because for for this reason, because it's so simple. And I do not have to care which service was installed in previous parents because I just dropped this JSON file and then magically it worked. It works. So this is pretty cool. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm, I said. I mean, the, the kid, I think the, the nicest feature is this overview here. But um, yeah. And and to give you an overview of all my images, uh, I think it's here. So a couple of Alpine ones, Alpine Edge I didn't use, Debian, a couple of them, Fedora I think the most, mm. and Ubuntu also some, so quite some, some uh, images. Yeah. And here you can specify different, so I, I have only one pipeline latest, but could have multiple pipelines. And I think the next would be to try out this different um, fan out, fan in stuff, and testing. And I think the fan in is yeah, it should be should be used because <laughs> you could have uh, like an artifact that has a test and then something else that has a test, and after the test you fan in, and then if all the tests are done, then should work. I was wondering how we are doing according to this picture, the finding out that. Let's say, and you have a change on the source code one or only. Does it mean that the rest, let's say, in the middle and in the bottom, are they also run, or they are just taken no. by artifacts, the last artifacts? Yeah, the last one. artifact. So if it's yeah, if the artifact change, then this triggers the one that is relying on this artifact. So uh, this, yeah, I, I was confused today uh, as well, but uh, it's pretty simple. So, uh, do I have an artifact here somewhere? Uh, maybe not. But um, to use the artifact, you have to specify a parent, and the parent has to create artifacts. Mm -hmm. So, if you have a Python build or Maven build or whatnot, <coughs> then this is a pipeline. This pipeline has an artifact, and this artifact is pushed to some directory and then in the build that should or the pipeline that should rely on this artifact you first have to uh, add the material so add the material like this parent trigger pipeline and then whatever pipeline creates an artifact and then you can use it in a later stage so here in jobs you can create oh no you 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 know you have you can create the task fetch artifact but for this you you need to rely on on a pipeline that has artifacts, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And as said, the, sadly, the Docker, do, Docker images are not, or maybe I haven't found it out. Maybe so if someone's watching, maybe the, maybe the I have to figure it out. That makes sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, maybe my scripts are screwed. Yeah, maybe I should use it. Yeah. No, normally it is like go cd in the end, create some artifacts. You specify which files are artifacts, and yeah. then in the next pipeline, you can just say, please give me the artifacts from this pipeline, from this pipeline, from this pipeline. An yeah. artifact in this sense is not like we are used to it, uh, like artifacts that are stored in a repository, let's say a Nexus, a Docker Hub, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's really <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we we could we could add a, a new test. We we, we we have this this setup here, right? So let's just create create a new a new pipeline. Call it test. Then take some random stuff from GitHub. Maybe some random stuff from my repository. Let's say. Um, what would make sense? Let's say we want to do this. So I have this. Check for the connection works. And then I, I want to, uh, I, maybe I should call it the same. Um, and I just touch test file, finish, and then I create an artifact which is test file, and the destination is just uh, let's say deploy, no target, and it's a build artifact. Oh, and we can try out the the test artifact, I haven't tried it out yet. So let's say I create an, H an HTML file as well, test HTML, which I haven't, but anyway, and then uh, reports. So this is now really new, I haven't tried it out before, but how hard yeah. could it be? Is this useful because then you can keep the artifact in test chart as far as I remember? Yeah, so I could create, yeah, it's, could I create like this, and then I do cut, Test HTML and then do H1 Hello World H1. Bah. Okay. I forgot what? Oh, uh, something I, I forgot something I said. Ah, yeah, right. Uh, but mm -hmm. it was not too much to type, so test. HTML. Mm -hmm. Hello, go CD. Make it even better. <laughs> Test. <laughs> okay. Save. Here we go. Okay. So now I have to put it to another environment and create a new environment for this. He, he only shows me the available patterns, which I also also like because otherwise, if you have 200 of them, yeah. it's a little bit annoying. And um, then I share, get all the agents, and I can set. I could have used environment variables, test eins, or let's say bar one, val one. <coughs> okay, it looks good. And now. Um, Let's only show the test environment. Ta-da! And make it a little bit smarter. Even smarter. But can I use, and I have to do this, right? One. Do we think that this will work? If I do this, I will see. <coughs> okay, so if I unpause, then it should trigger the build. And then I need to um, add this, this this tab. Ah, here, yeah. Triggers the build. It shows um, somewhere. It shows why it was triggered. Yeah, right. 
I think because it wasn't triggered before. So oh. there was a change in the GitHub repository because there was no GitHub repository before, so that should trigger. Like, the in, like initial, yeah? Yeah, the initial one. So we, yeah, now we have this, yeah, test one. Mm, in ELF. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, and so now we can create a new, so how was it done? I think, uh, okay. let's see, pipelines. Mm. 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 Custom tab. Tab name. Uh, HTML. And report test HTML. Save. Here we go. See? Bam. Oh, no, not bam. Bam. Uh, bam. Ta da! How cool is that? <laughs> Worked. Mm -hmm. Demo god is it's good to me today. <laughs> okay, but why is EOF there? Because that if I do this, then var wouldn't be evaluated, would it? Let's see. So I can and, and I can trigger it. I can just trigger it here, and I can trigger it with some changes. So that's also cool. So I can do try or two, and then it would trigger. Yeah, it should trigger any minute now. Here we go. Uh -huh. Makes also sense. No, you see, that's what I thought. But why is it? Uh, anyway. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So this is this is pipelines, and I haven't tried out the. Um, I said the different fan outs, fans ins, and that's something that I'm going to explore. And also, also the API. Also something to explore. Yeah. And um, what else? So I will delete this stuff. Delete the environment. And this I really like. It's very intuitive, at least to me. I mean, it's very you know you you know intuitively where where, where to go. Then you have a, an XML. That, that's also a drawback because I don't like XML, but. You have um, so if we go, ah, get orchestra, go city. Um, I bind mount somewhere here. I bind mount the configuration to the server, which is also nice. So if you download this go city knip terminal directory, you can just start the stack and it will look like this, but without all the builds. So it takes about one hour or so to build all the Docker images. But they are st they are just stored in in this one cruise config XML. The rest are just runtime um, runtime things. So we we here have this knor uh, terminal for the win auto register key and all the pipelines and so all the configuration is here. That's quite quite cool. Which also means so that this changes if I change if I change the code or if I change the pipelines, but that's easy. So just um, put this in the in the GitHub, and then you can just um, yeah, everyone can start it. And this basically is the idea that I would like to do next, kind of where I just carve out um, special parts of the pipeline. For instance, if I want to show, or if I if I'm at this Alpine console image, that I have a Go CD directory in which you can just start only the part of the Go CD that is that concerns with uh, or is concerned with Alpine console. So that every developer that would be the vision, every developer can go to a certain um, to a certain project, and the same way that he finds a Docker con com uh, compose file to start the stack, he should also have a Docker compose file to 
build a start the build pipeline because I think this is something that would be very very nice if everyone can work uh, like in production so build in like in production but with a reduced set of build pipelines because you don't want to run if you are a big company or you have a lot of images like I have um, you don't want to run your pipeline with 100 images every time you only have a slight change in one slight project mm -hmm. and I think that would be nice but this is something that I would like to to do next so the stack to do next is growing <laughs> anyway yeah um, I think I forgot something but Here's backup. I haven't used this. I think this. Oh, this I should use maybe. So backup. Uh, yeah. And as, as I said, this is also nice. But um, I think there's no um, Alpine APK type uh, uh, plugin. <coughs> but maybe this will change. But everything could be scripted. So and I should. I think what I should do really next to so put it on top of the uh, to do next stack is to get rid of this um, template ugliness because I mean ugliness uh, first it's named all the same it's very stupid I don't know what I was thinking and uh, all these bash scripts also seems very uh, ugly in hindsight <laughs> maybe I should change this as well and as uh, someone says I think you said that this in uh, in uh, in github makes sense as well right so oh someone will does it somehow deal with um, environment and something like network address and stuff, or do you have to uh, keep track of this? What do you mean? So, but then the IP address is. Uh, services and they have IP addresses, and you have that um, endings uh, window thing. Um, and uh, it sounded like you were hard configuring it, or is it. Uh, uh, no, I use the console DNS names for that. Ah, I see. And, uh, uh, I don't know Congo, uh, so uh, they they uh, uh, they provide uh, uh, it provides yeah yeah it provides a DNS server and the DNS server so if you if you start a console agent in one of the containers then it will register the node as name of the container or the host name of the container dot node dot console and if you have services in this uh, container then it will also register the services which you specify and then you can just use this DNS names. This is the reason why I don't go to Docker 1.10 something because uh, Docker 1.10 uses an embedded DNS server that really kind of breaks my console setup. But <laughs> they said that the next version they will make sure that the DNS server is not blocking someone from using the minus minus DNS flag to go uh, localhost. Because how it's set up in 1.10 is that they assume that you use external DNS servers, which is, I think, a fair assumption, but not for me, yeah, obviously. So, because I want to use the local host one. And the DNS server is in a different IP address space somehow, or IP net namespace, I guess. So, if I say local host, then it's local host to the embedded DNS server's namespace. So, this won't work anyway. Yeah. Um, how do you test that? Or can I speak now to how you build it, but how do you test that? How, the, the, how do I test the pipeline or how do I test the containers? The containers that you have in the images. Yeah, I have like here this template uh, somewhere down below. I have this Docker build, Docker build, and then I have this test thingy um, here. So first I no test is here. Uh, here. So if I find a directory called test, then I go into the directory test and then I run this run okay. script. And we saw this run script from the the uh, window thingy. And there's the Nginx and the window is the only one where I have this test directory. But I mean, I have this qu quite famous AELK stack image, which is downloaded a couple of times now. And every once so often, someone says, OK, uh, you updated this stuff, and then uh, it doesn't work anymore. And it would be nice to have regression tests. I mean, I should do it manually, but yeah, I'm not the manual guy somehow. So yeah, I would like to do some tests so that I can make sure that all the images I have, that they provide the functionality that I expect. So mm -hmm. having the already? Because you said uh, you have some tests for, for the engine. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, well, what are you testing there? Are you starting an Nginx and testing features of it, or 
Uh, you, you just came, I guess, because I showed it here. So I have the script here where I start the stack, and mm -hmm. the stack comprises of this window, Nginx proxy, and um, two Nginx servers. One Nginx is called Nginx, and the second is Nginx2. Mm -hmm. And when I start, I mean, I can start the stack. Oh, no, I can't because I haven't. I, I have to set up the... Okay. Anyway, but yeah, because I... Ah, anyway, <laughs> um, because this pro this wants to to have this build image name, and yeah, yeah I don't. But anyway, so it will start the stack, and then it will do this curl tests, and if the curl tests yeah. fail, then I know that something is fishy, and maybe this will continue, go to my chat ops pipeline, which I haven't set up now. I use Slack for setups, I think, but I hate Slack nowadays because I have the book list channel where I put the book that I want to buy in the channel. So when someone can guess what happens if you don't use Slack for some time and then you restart your Slack client. <laughs> oh. Now all my books are gone. <laughs> I don't have time to read them anyway, but it would be nice. Anyway, <clears throat> yeah, that's that. I think... Um, yeah, I talked long enough <laughs> now. Some uh, some more questions? Uh, yeah, I'm still not done with configuration because apart from the network addresses that are um, provided by console, there is so much... Uh, you have all those um, variables you use. Um, are, is there some central re registry or something like it? In what, what, what configuration do you mean? The, the, in your scripts, you have all those um, batch environment variables. Do, do, do you set them in the same scripts? Uh, uh, scripts are they uh, provided to the other uh, pipelines or images? And As you have for, for each environment, you have the pipelines associated with this environment, and then you have agents associated with, and then you can provide environment variables. Ah, that was the part I was missing, okay. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. And this is, yeah, this was the part that... Yeah. So what is actually the scope of environment variables in that case? They are on a, defined on a pipeline, on, on agent, or...? No, they are introduced into the build when the pipeline is built. The so pipeline you, belongs to an environment. Yeah, and, and it could only belong to only one environment. Whereas, oh no, so it's, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So if you want to create... I have, I think I only have one, but I could have one latest where I tag latest, but I could have um, yeah another pipeline that looks for uh, master or whatnot, so you could imagine have multiple. But it means new environment in that case, yeah? Yeah. yeah. But I think I, I think I could figure out a way, or I hope, with, with all the other plugins maybe, and I think that's, that was this pull request plugin, for instance, that would provide you with um, information about Oh no, not pull request. There was one one cool other thing. Uh, branch feature branch. I think this one here. As far as I understood it, I mean, if you you create feature, or like you create a branch other than the master branch, and then it will trigger if you create a branch like test, mm -hmm. then it will trigger a build. And it will provide the build with an environment variable as to what the name of the branch is yeah. that triggered the build. So yeah. you could have, like you could have with Docker Hub as well, you could say uh, every branch that is not master branch, uh, just build an image that is tagged with the branch name. And I think this is what you could do here as well. So mm -hmm. just... Um, well, what you can do is you have an environment, a staging, light, etc., and then you have a split pipeline at the, uh, the front, and then you have a pipeline, deploy the production, deploy the staging, etc. And then they have the settings for yeah. production uh, yeah. uh, staging, and you commit code to the first pipeline build, and it automatically or manually, whatever you want, triggers the deploy to the staging pipeline and the deploy to. to yeah, the and you, you can have the material, so, so the, you can have this across multiple pipelines, so you yes. could. You could, as you said, you go through the first pipeline okay. and then you trigger the second pipeline and so on and so on. And you take all your all the materials with you. Yeah, and, and I mean, and since there is a lot of API stuff going on, you could, you could, as we created this new tab, HTML, mm -hmm. I mean, you could imagine that you create an HTML that has the correct, um, the correct uh, button to, to, to accept 
the, the user acceptance mm -hmm. test. So you have a video, whatever, or whatever you whatever you can create to to present the results, and then you have a URL that you dynamically create, which will trigger the next pipeline, for instance. Sounds not so mm -hmm. hard to do, I guess. So basically, yeah. the trigger can be done by GitHub or whatever commit, but also the being the parent of another, being the parent of another pipeline over there, yeah? Yeah, yeah so this is, this is the agent stuff I showed on oh, no, the agent stuff, the material here. So this is the trigger. And uh, you could add a trigger that comes from something here, or here package, but I haven't, I haven't, uh, okay. I haven't uh, configured YAM or, or Debian, but the let's say pipeline here, and then I can, I can uh, trigger it by this image. If this image is built, I only have one pipeline. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit stupid, but here, this, for instance, Alpine Base Edge is from the Edge. Mm -hmm. Pipelines and yeah. And so you could have two pipelines uh, that are depending on each other. Let's say pipeline one and pipeline two leads to pipeline one. It is when you start pipeline two, it uses the last successful build from the, okay. from yeah. the old pipeline. Yeah. So um, when you need manual steps, it is safe. Just click it. Okay. In the worst case, it takes the last screen build from two years ago, but normally. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I, I, I haven't used this to the full extent. I, I, pr I pretty much created this ugly template. I now call it ugly, but I will. I, it's, it's not that ugly. But anyway, I created this template and then I created all the pipelines. So it was like the automation with my mouse and my fingers was like building, yeah. adding one pipeline every 30 seconds or so. And then it was like, chick, 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 and now I have this full amount. And with all this uh, different, um, yeah, post supposed, I, I create all the tests, then it would be pretty cool. But I think th I, I shouldn't create, this is a kind of a workaround, I shouldn't create this this test folder with a run script that's kind of boring, should be like really a, a different stage or a different pipeline to, yeah. to create the test or run the test. So mm -hmm. not have one task, I think that's, that's not the that's not the purpose of one job to have like f 10 tasks to do everything it should be a little bit different so if you have multiple tests that could run in parallel then you should have multiple stages or jobs i don't know you have to figure out how to set it up that that you fan out all the tests at once they can run in parallel mm -hmm. and then then you go to the next stage that i think that would be something and if your stages now you see every pipeline has only one stage Yep. If you have more than one stage, let's say the first one is a sample and then test, you could just restart only a specific stage. Okay. Yeah, so let's exactly. say you have five tests and they are flaky, then you don't have to uh, restart the whole pipeline. You can just yeah. let's say restart the UI. Yeah, and, and I think I said here this, this fan out, fan in, that makes a lot of sense. This test environment here, for instance, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense to have this somehow. I have a question to the fan in, fan out. Um, where do you see if, um, for example, build three years hanging, um, interrupting, whatever, uh, or finishing maybe two months later? How can you see in, uh, some half-finished flows uh, at which point they are stopped, uh, interrupted, whatever? And mm -hmm. the second question uh, about the fan out. Uh, if you fan out, you're really paralyzed and you may overwhelm a host running this, um, having to keep capable to, to do this. Uh, I saw this this tagging of must be capable of running some stuff, some tagging stuff. Uh, but is there also some some limiting like numbers? Well I guess so. I I'm, I haven't tried it out. It's limited so. by the number of agents. Yeah because yeah. it depends on the number of agents. Yeah. No and, and you can yeah and, and what what you what you can do you could as said here you could limit the number of agents for each environment. So you could say okay this environment which would be the test environment could only run on this two test uh, agents for instance and, and then you have uh, was running a task is busy and this, uh, yeah. 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 okay all right and then you, you could have other, other tasks. Yeah. yeah i mean and then you could have one big machine with well, let's say one big machine with only a couple of agents that are running all the cool builds and then you have one machine with a lot of agents that are running tests mm -hmm. that you do not care about 
maybe so, and so much. Well, this is when the resource checking comes into play. So let's yeah. say you have yeah. five machines and yeah. you check three with tasks yeah. and one with tasks. And I'm so not sure. very fast to life so that you have one left. And maybe, but I, I'm not sure, maybe you could even run a, an integration test where you have two agents interacting. Maybe, don't know, maybe not. Maybe it's not a good idea, but maybe, maybe you can. I don't know. Yeah, but this is, as I said, I, this is something I haven't tried out. I mean, we, we could have a look um, and create a, or have a look at the task, mm. if there is. Would it be easy to create stuff, like a thing that you are building the pipeline over there, which will be run only when the commit happens, and run some basic unit test and so on, and then define another pipeline which depends on that first pipeline, yep. but uh, in a way that when the first pipeline is run, unit test, it doesn't trigger automatically the next pipeline, but when you run manually on a Chrome or whatever, the second thing, it will take into consideration the first one and just copy the artifact and so on. Yeah, yeah. I'm, if you... Yeah, I, I, it should. So if if I I have this, I had this, this uh, material thingy here. Uh, you could create. You could create um, a dependency. Yeah. Yeah, but my point is that even when you create dependency over here, does this dependency also is reflected on the job which created the guy? You know what I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if yeah, yeah, that. But I mean, does it? I'm not sure if it makes much, or if it doesn't make. I mean, if you create, if you depend on an artifact, yeah, then you want to trigger if the artifact is built. I mean, otherwise it won't be continuous, right? And it's an yeah. incontinuous delivery. Yeah, but you can. It works. It works. If you have two pipelines, yeah. The so first one just creates an artifact, and the other one takes it. Yeah. Then you can say the second pipeline runs every hour. Yes. Ah, and okay. And then it always takes the newest one, the newest green one. Okay, gotcha. That, that works. Ah, yeah, okay. Gotcha. Uh, and then fun. the first thing, the first pipeline can be run on a comet, per comet, let's say, yeah? Yes. Yes. Ah, it's so kind of a nightly build, basically. Yes, yeah. because yeah. Yeah, okay, very often sense. you just really want to just, do, yeah. I don't know, run some long integration test or whatever, yeah. and you don't want to run them at the same speed as you have a comet, yeah, sure, yeah? Sure. but then if they, when they are run, you don't want to build again and run unit tests and so on, you want to reuse the existing artifacts. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it makes sense. This is how we are doing it with the deployed pipelines. So we don't do continuous deployment. Yeah. So uh, the deployed pipelines are manually triggered. You mean this guy over, over here, yeah. yeah? Yeah. And yeah, it's just like an idea bit, but manually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit less than an idea bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it works. Yeah, okay. Now that would be continuous delivery, right? Yes. I learned something today. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. With a manual trigger, yeah? Yeah. And then you can just deploy whenever you want and by clicking or yeah. nightly or whatever. And you can even select if, if you have a deployment and it depends on more than one pipeline, then you can even select from every pipeline which one you want to use in case you have an, uh, have an error. Let's say you you deploy and you have three dependencies and all get a new version. Yeah. And now you deploy or run test and it fails and you yeah. don't know which, which one. combination yeah. has worked. And then you can really select I want to have build one from pipeline A and build three from pipeline B. Okay. And this uh, goes to the new and but this uh, you can pipeline. this you can do here as well. That's also kind of nice. Yeah, you this can is this one yes. You can just. Uh, say okay, I would like to have this commit or this commit to to trigger or to use in the build. Where is that? Uh, so is this will trigger just yeah. a fresh build, ah, okay, and yeah, this yeah. one is trigger with options. <laughs> okay. Sounds a little bit fishy, but it's uh, just selecting. Okay, and these guys are much more here more as a material in this um, yeah. parent. Yeah. Think, yeah, but and if you have, I mean, this I can select here the different the different materials, right? Okay, so this yeah, one is yeah. a Git repository and this one is uh, um, the parent trigger, which the is parent a parent. Mm -hmm. So if, if this parent would have more than one revision, I could... So you, you can pick, yeah? Yeah, so for instance, I should, oh, should have... 
here I could pick one of the two. Yeah. And what I really like is this uh, this view. I, I, I'm showing I'm showing it again. This view here, which shows you all changes from all the parents even. So okay. in this I added nmap and bc and I added the docker compose file. I mean this doesn't make sense for the build or doesn't make any difference for the build, but anyway. So if I have like, and I have a lot of long, very long pipelines here. No, not very long, but rather long. So I think in the Fedora one there longer. Here. So like this guy here, I uh, failed this one. Much, yeah. So I could could I can see with one page from top to bottom what what changed in all the different parents. Mm -hmm. This I really like because this is I mean often right that you want to know what changed in all the different dependencies and mm -hmm. that's kind of nice mm -hmm. okay so far so good and i mean i could do an update in half a year or so when i uh, dig the, the pile that i just created um dig through it with all the fan out and fan in and all that stuff and all the api stuff but i think it's uh yeah i said it's my favorite now but i i haven't tried it gitlab ci and i I misused Jenkins, so I, I never touch Jenkins again. <laughs> Maybe it's a psychological thing. Um, yeah, but I think that's one of the nicer ones, even if it's Java. Okay.